Hello everyone, for those who want to really understand conductors, I recommend watching this video. Here we have a conductor and an insulator. You probably know already that conductors transfer electric current easily. Insulators are simply non-conductors, which means they don't transfer electric current easily. I'm not saying they cannot transfer at all, but it is just very difficult. So why does electric current flow easily through conductors, but not through insulators? The reason for this lies in the conduction band. I'll try to explain it as simple as possible. Let's first talk about atoms. Here we have hydrogen atom, here we have carbon atom, and here we have chlorine atom. The gray dotted circles are the seven achievable orbits according to the periodic table. We all learned that the outermost shells are called valence shells. This is where chemistry stuff happens, right? Like drawing Lewis structures and showing bondings with different atoms, you remember? Again, valence shells are the outermost shells of the atoms. Now, there's something called conduction shell. So this is simply the next shell beyond valence shell. If an electron is in a conduction shell, or even outside of that shell, it becomes a free electron, meaning it doesn't need to stay with the atom. It can move to another atom's conduction shell whenever it wants. Why are electrons free in the conduction shell? This is quite obvious. Think about the definition of the valence shell again. Valence shell is the outermost shell probably because that's the farthest the atom can hold on to its electrons, right? That's what valence shell is. So any electrons farther than that point cannot be caught by the atom. Alright, let me now simplify the drawing. Okay, each orbit corresponds to an energy level like this, right? Here I'm just assuming that the first energy level is not shown. As you see, this is the second and third energy level. And there is an energy gap in between the two energy levels. So unless the electron has a sufficient amount of energy to excite to the next level, it remains trapped by the atom and stays in the lower level. So here's our question. How can we free an electron without injecting any energy? Like metals. You probably heard that metals are good conductors because they have free electrons in their conduction shells. But how can metals have electrons in their conduction shells in the first place without any additional energy? You know what? Here's a common misconception among many students. When we say metals are good conductors, it doesn't mean that their atoms are good conductors. Don't get confused. No single atom in this world can have a free electron on its own in the first place because of this energy gap. This gap is the problem. To have the concept of a conductor, we need to scale up from the level of an atom to that of a molecule or material. You remember these energy level diagrams from high school chemistry? When we have two atoms trying to bond together, they undergo hybridization like this, right? After hybridization, the electrons stay here on the bottom to form bonds, and this is called molecular orbitals. And we get this new shell on top that looks just like a conduction shell, because it's an empty shell. So one atom will just have a valence shell, and when two atoms forms a bond, we suddenly have a conduction shell. If three atoms are bonded, we'll have a variety of energy level combinations. You see the energy gap is becoming smaller? But at this point, someone might ask, can we really bond so many atoms at once? Like when we draw Lewis structures, the number of bonds is always limited, right? But hold on, we can reconsider what bonding really means. Bonding describes an interaction between two atoms. Even if they're not right beside each other, as long as they're close enough, there will still be some level of interaction between all the atoms. So let me show you something. Here are the molecular orbitals or the molecular valence shell 
and the empty conduction shell that we had from hybridization, we still have some gap in between the two shells, right? Now watch. If we bring the atoms closer together, they will start affecting not just the neighboring atoms, but also those next to them, because they are close now. And due to the different interactions, the valence shell and the conduction shell gradually diversify, so it got wider, as you can see. So I'm going to put them even closer now. The valence and the conduction shells eventually become bands. Oh, now look! Do you see any gap in between the red and the yellow regions here? Now electrons can simply hop onto the conduction band. So this means for the metals, we would expect them to have zero energy gap or band gap like this, right? Because they're conductors. Metal. So yes, metals have zero energy gap because they're bonded very close to each other. On the other hand, non-metals are usually not bonded close enough to eliminate the energy gap. So this is why metals are good conductors, because they have zero energy gap or band gap. And non-metals are insulators because of the gap between the valence and the conduction bands. However, this also means something. This means if electrons can somehow get to the conduction band, non-metals can also become conductors. How can we excite those electrons from their valence shells? Any good idea you have? You might have already guessed it. We can heat it up. There you go. An artificial conductor. But of course, you would have to apply an enormous amount of heat for an insulator to become a conductor. It would be quite a challenging task. Because of this reason, we now talk about semiconductors. These are metalloids, which means a mixture of metals and non-metals. So these ones have relatively small band gaps. So you need to apply just a little extra heat to make it a conductor. Here I'm going to show some nice online periodic table from ptable.com. Materials made of these elements are mostly insulators. Those made of these are mostly semiconductors. And those made of these elements are mostly conductors. So that was the explanation about the conductors so far. Before we end this video, I'll just quickly show you some examples. So you can imagine that these don't conduct electricity easily, right? And on the other side, we could think of these materials. And lastly, for semiconductors, we have these two famous materials for our great human technology. Alright, thanks for watching the video. And in the next video, I'm going to show some math for those taking the electromagnetism course.